Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Hannah. I'm the assistant director here at the Billings Public Library, and uh, thank you for coming to the latest event in the Billings Public Library author series. Dr. Catherine Raven is a former park ranger with the Glacier, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Voyagers, and Yellowstone National Parks. Dr. Raven's essays have appeared in American Scientist, Journal of American Mensa, and Montana Magazine. Currently, she is a professor at South University in Savannah, Georgia. Dr. Raven is with us today to discuss her book, Fox and I, An Uncommon Friendship. If you would like, you can also purchase the book and some really gorgeous others back there from this house of books. And if you would, please join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Raven. Thank you, everybody, for being here on this beautiful day in Billings. And I live about two hours away up in the mountains, the same place I was living when I uh, wrote the book. Well, the first thing I want to start talking about is voice. That's a really important characteristic of books and writing, and it's one of the things that people noticed about my book when I first started sending it around. It won a few contests, which really helps when you're nobody trying to get somebody to find you and read your book. And I had never studied voice and what, what is meant by that, so I kind of figured it out on my own. And we mostly think that voice is what's coming out from me to you and the way that I say things differently. But actually, voice comes from what's out coming in. Voice is primarily about your observations. Each of us will look at the same scene and experience the same scene, and yet we interpret it differently. So the first thing you have to know about voice is it comes from how you see the outside world, so how you're processing it. And one of the things that, that voice reminds me of is this, something that happened when I was a professor at the University of Montana, a, an assistant professor, and I was doing field work on small mammals, and I was out in central Montana on this huge ranch, and it was hunting season, as it always seems to be, and this rig comes by with a huge mule deer and his racks hanging out the back of the pickup, and I saw the license plate. It was a vanity plate, and it said, gut and tag on it, so, oh my goodness, I'm a hunter too, so I know what the law is, and the law says, as soon as you drop that animal, you have to tag it first before you gut it. But a lot of, well, I was gonna say us, but a lot of people save the tag, they gut the animal first, clean it, and if you don't bump into a game warden, you get to save your tag for another animal. So you get two animals with one tag, or three or four. In other words, you save your tag until you see a warden, and that's totally against the law. So when I saw the rig with the license plate with the slogan of all poachers, which is gut and tag, I was so excited. Nobody else would have noticed that, right? That's my unique observation of the scene. So I called the game warden, and I was up at the ranch house, and the game warden came in, and the rancher was there, and the game warden's got his little notebook taking notes. I was so proud of myself because I called in a poacher. <laughs> and he said, um, you know, what, what did the... Uh, what was the license plate? Ha, that's how I knew he was a poacher. His license plate said, gut and tag. And the rancher was just, you could see steam coming out of his ears. That's my friend. He's German. The license plate is Gutentag. <laughs> I was so mortified because I was an assistant professor and I don't know anything about German or French or anything. I don't speak any languages besides English. It was so embarrassing. So that is, um, that's voice, you know, that's, that's how you take in the outside world. That was my story about catching a poacher on this rancher's land. Somebody else's story would have been how cool it is that this German guy is, uh, is an American citizen, a Montana citizen, and a hunter, and his license plate says something like, good morning, or how are you, or I'm not a poacher, whatever, <laughs> whatever Gutentag means, I never figured that out, but... Anyway, that's what you, first thing you need to know about voice. You also should know that it's not just, when we take in the outside world, it's not just what we see. Well, we tend to be really a visual species, but there are other things that are going on that are probably equally important. 
and sound is one of them, but no matter what sense we're using, we all, all of us and all animals, have a signal, something very important to us that we focus in on and we turn everything else into noise. If you've, if you've read Fox and I, I describe how animals hear other animals talking. So when we hear something in the background like quack, 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 but ducks don't hear quack, quack, quack. They hear something very specific. But we're laser focused on the humans that we're talking to in the park. So the barking and the tweeting and the quacking, we make that into background noise. So separating a signal from noise is something that all animals do to be successful. And each of us, each of us separates the background noise from whatever signal we're focused on. And that becomes a really important part of an individual's voice when you're writing. It's those things that you focus on. For my students in my biology class, I like them to read, Horton, here's a who. Do you remember that story? Of course. I love Dr. Zeus. He's really important for graduate students in biology. And that is a very important book because Horton, here's a who, is a great demonstration of signal versus noise, because Horton is trying to hear the little who, he saw him and he heard him once, and then the bird drops the clover with the who in this meadow of like eight trillion billion little clovers, and Horton has to focus on that one signal, I am here, I am here, I am here, and he has to turn everything else into background noise. But each of us, everybody does that all the time. We know that animals do that to be successful. So that's if you're a writer and you're trying to figure out, I hope, I hope you're all going to be writing, you're trying to figure out what is your voice. Keep, keep that in mind and try that with some people that you're with and see what, what's their signal at a specific point. What is it that they're focused on and what are the things that they turn into background noise. And, and by the way, my favorite writer, the one that I always mention at every one of these talks, the one that influenced me the most, Hilary Mantel, she talks a lot, she writes a lot about, oh, I guess I should say wrote, Hilary Mantel died yesterday. Um, uh, so Hilary Mantel, and you should read everything she wrote. Hilary Mantel also writes about having to drop things out of her life, but she's never studied biology, so she doesn't use the expression signal and noise. But she talks about having to just let things go by the way so many things have to just go by in order for you to find where you're going, your direction, what's important in your writing, and everybody's going a different way. And then one more thing, and then I'm gonna stop and ask questions, and I will ask for questions as I go through the talk today. Something you really need to keep in mind when you're writing, and your voice, is that you're not just gonna have one voice. A lot of writers have a writing voice, and their own, I don't, I just write my own voice, whether it's fiction, which I'm working on now, or nonfiction. But, because I never studied writing, so I wasn't told to have a writing voice, so unfortunately, what you get is just what, what you get when you read Fox and I, it's just me. But I do teach students, and so I do have another voice, and that's my professor voice. It's two different voices, why? because they're two different audiences. And you have to keep that in mind when you're developing your voice. It's not just what the outside world is bringing into you and how you observe it, but you also absolutely need to have an audience. If you don't have a specific audience, your voice is gonna keep changing. S and mine definitely changes from talking to students versus when I'm writing and I'm talking to the public. In fact, I was teaching graduate students when I started writing this book and I switched because I wanted to deal with gen ed folks, non-majors, I really, and I love it and I stayed with it and because, well, because I discovered that people that aren't studying biology are also really smart people. <laughs> Who would have known? I was so shocked. Uh, they're creative and they're really smart, so I decided, wow. I'm gonna stick with the non-majors, but it helped a lot because it helped me uh, get a little bit away from being in that professor voice all the time. One of the things that I like to, to t a story that I like to tell that explains how important your audience is. You, you remember Dr. Livingston in, in Africa? 
so he, he was very educated, of course, and he has a guide with him while he was there. His guide was not educated at all. So there's two different people with two different abilities to understand the world and the complexity of the world. And they even use different vocabulary, of course. The guide's job is mostly to set up the tent and take down the tent, make sure that Livingston has food, fetch water, kill things that might need to be killed, ferocious things that might eat them. So that's what the guide does and Livingston does the thinking. One night, the guide wakes up Dr. Livingston and is caught. Doctor, 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 look. And there's billions of stars above them. And Dr. Livingston says, oh, yes. Son, you're astounded. I know. It's a lot to take in because you haven't, you haven't studied what I've studied and you haven't been able to really appreciate the complex questions in the world. But when, when I look at all those stars, billions of them, I realize we're not alone in the universe. And I ask myself, why would we be? Should we be? Should we look for life on other planets? There are endless questions that those billions of stars bring to mind. But those questions are all really complex for someone like you who has no education yet. But someday, when you have an education, you'll be able to understand the really rigorous thinking, the layers of thinking that goes into the kinds of things we think when we see billions of stars. And the guide says, yep, 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 yep so, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but I was, I was just thinking, who's, who's, who stole our tent? <laughs> and um, that is really a good example of the two different kinds of, you have to know if you're writing a book for Dr. Livingston, uh, uh, my book is mostly asking about who stole our tent, <laughs> more so than complex questions. I like to think that my book gives readers permission to ask whatever questions you would like to ask and realize that you don't have to be a scientist to answer them because human nature gives you the privilege of common sense. And you can use common sense and human nature, which we've been using for hundreds of thousands of years to answer questions. But this is basically a where's the tent kind of a, a, a book. And so I'm gonna stop before I get into telling you the important things that I learned about animals from having a best friend that was a fox and see if you have any questions about voice or techniques that I used when I was writing. Everybody's so shy. <laughs> There's one in the back. Well, there are two voices. Well, the other animals sometimes too, but you know, fox, has a voice here too, and I, even even human best friends, I'm not sure how comfortable I would be guessing, this is my friend Rachel here, I'm not sure if I put her in a book, how comfortable I would be with making up her voice. So how did you how did you come up with Fox's voice then? That's a, um, and, and thank you, and that's a really good question about Fox's voice. So the, the book where it's written in first person, that's me talking, there's plenty of times in the book that are third person. I, I'm writing like from a narrator's point of view, and the animals are he and she, not I. They're not writing in their own voice though. I'm writing like Hilary Mantel. She wrote a really, she writes third person, a really close third person. So when you're reading those sections about Fox, the magpie, the ants, you're reading it in third person, but how do I get to their voice? And I think I'm going to say that Frank McCourt, he wrote Angela's Ashes. Have, have, did anybody read Angela's Ashes? I loved Angela's Ashes, and I read it a couple of times. He's another person who wrote without studying writing. He, I think he was a math teacher, but he was a teacher anyway in, in New York. I read Angela's Ashes, and, and Angela's his mother, and I realized when I was reading that that he was basing Angela's voice, her story, on parts of her life that happened before he was even born, decades before he was born in some cases. And also from reading the book closely, I realized that he didn't spend all that much time with her, even though she was his mother. 
um, because he's a small child and she had lots of other children also, I realized that I spent more time with the fox and then I realized I'd probably spend more time with the fox during those years we were together than people spend with their spouses. So I realized, first of all, that I knew him really well because we were together every day. How did I get to think about what he was thinking? First of all, I knew the science. That's the first thing was that I knew the, the science about the generic fox. I talk about the generic fox sometimes in the book. That's how I knew he wasn't a generic fox. <laughs> so I knew about the generic fox, and then I had tons of observations of him every single day, either together, really close, physically close, or and I never touched him, by the way, physically close, or I was watching him in binoculars, watching him in a spotting scope, usually doing all of that. So I was watching him from a distance, watching him with other creatures, watching him with me, interacting with him day after day after day. And then finally, the third thing is then the comparison with other foxes. So first the science, then I have tons of observations, and then I looked at how other foxes acted compared to him so I could see him as an individual. There's always foxes on my property. There had been lots of foxes in my life, some of them with dens much closer than his. And so I knew how they acted, and then I compared the way they acted to fox. That's the beginning. Those three steps are the beginning. Um, and what you, you might be interested in, some of the specific observations were things like where he sat. And that's how I was able to finally figure out, and he's so finicky about where he sat, but he could be because he was a really good hunter. He wasn't starving, he wasn't scrawny. This, this last June with all the rain we had, the fox, the main fox on my property got very scrawny, so she wasn't doing a very good job hunting, but rain is a really hard situation for foxes to hunt in because of the sound. Because he was such a good hunter, he had a lot of freedom. In fact, he seemed to have a better life than me and he certainly had more hobbies than I did. That was really clear. My hobby was worrying, basically. He had a, a lot of free time because he didn't have to spend too much time hunting. So he could sit where he, he sat where he wanted to sit. He liked the sun. He liked to be really warm. And he would sit in that spot where there was sun, but he didn't want his eyes in the sun when he was walking. So he would just move around his trail so that the sun wasn't in his eyes but he really liked to be on a warm piece of ground. And he also liked gravelly ground to sit when he was rubbing himself, he liked the gravel, but when he was just sitting, he wanted you know, bunch grasses, grasses and then there's bunches. He made sure he was in a little bunch of dirt and it was almost always the exact same spot. And there was one flower in my meadow where he and I used to sit, one, it was a forget-me-not. And he liked to be really close to that forget-me-not, so close that he could just lick it. So I got the not-so-very-nice place to sit, and he had that place. It made me realize that he had a little bit of a sense of aesthetics. And then I realized it more when I went up to his den, and I realized that humans aren't the only animals that appreciate art. I think that he... I mean, he wanted to be where that one little blue flower was. There was something about that one flower that he really liked. Are there any more? I know it's sad. Did you read the book? <laughs> if you read a book about a wild animal, then you have to expect that it's like reading a book about World War II. I mean, you know there's not gonna be, there's not really a very good ending. I mean, it's lots of bad things happen. And when you read a book about a wild animal, they just don't live um, very long. That's unfortunate. The important, I learned a lot of important things about humans and other animals working with a fox and having a best friend who's a fox. And I, I mean, it's not a secret to me anymore. It was at one time. I was kind of shocked to find out that when you tell people that your best friend is a wild red fox, un unless they're really dopey, they know right away that your only friend is a wild fox. <laughs> But I, I was, it took me a while to figure that out, and then I thought I probably should not be maybe telling so many people this without a more of a precursor. So it's, I mean, it's an it's a odd, but anyway, uh, yes, you guys probably would have known, right? Anyway, 
one of the things that I learned about spending so much time with him was that I had been, because of my training as a biologist and my work as a park ranger, dividing the world into uh, these categories. And I, I have to see things in my mind. I can't just have some theoretical thing that makes no sense. What I see when I have categories are Venn diagrams. You remember those, the circles? That, so there's a circle that says humans and there's a circle that says other animals. If you take the animal kingdom, it's one big circle though and we're all members of the animal kingdom. But I now have different Venn diagrams bouncing around in my mind and I can't stop now. The, those circles are wild and domestic. So instead of humans and all other animals, my categories are wild and domestic. And some people are in both of those, each of those categories. And there's some animals that are in each of those categories. So I switched around the categories and I think that's one of the most important things that I learned from spending so much time is that there's better ways to organize the world, the animal world, than just humans and other animals. Can I do a little bit of a, a reading that kind of, I think, um, uh, brings that point maybe home a little bit. And let's see what page. It is. Oops. Well, it's sort of at the end. Here we go. Well, one of the things that I reference in this section is uh, Four Kit Night. Four Kits. Kits is, is the name of uh, baby foxes. Maybe you call them cubs, and that's okay, but I call them kits. And uh, Four Kit Night was the night that he brought all four of his kits out and in a nearly full moon for me to babysit. It was really the event that made me realize I needed to write a book about him. Um, soon, oh, can I ask you one question before we start? I can't see the time and I don't want to. Um, Okie dokie. Oh, you're so wonderful. Thank you. I knew we weren't getting close, but I don't want to keep you too. Okay, thanks. Soon after four kit night, I began trading in fox currency which is to say I reassigned my desires and the prices I was willing to pay for their fulfillment. The incident made me think back to a simpler time in my life when I was a young ranger in Mount Rainier National Park's wilderness and only windshield glass, painted steel, and Michelin tires protected me and everything I owned from the world. During my park ranger days, the spotted owl war divided our community. It started when an organization nominated spotted owls and their habitat, old growth forests, for protection under the Endangered Species Act. Because so many local jobs involved harvesting timber from the old growth, some people believed that placing spotted owls on the list would decimate the economy. And so it was that everyone in our community aligned him or herself with the listers or the loggers. One night, in the middle of this fighting, I swung open the bathroom door of a bar in Packwood, Washington, and in place of the toilet tissue, found a handwritten sign with a question, are you out of toilet paper? And an answer, wipe your ass with a spotted owl. <laughs> More disconcerting than the misspelling of toilet <laughs> was the implication that our need for toilet paper justify destroying old growth forests. I like toilet paper as much as any semi-civilized person, but I would rather have wiped my ass with poison ivy than with tissue paper made from a 400-year-old tree. I was just a blue-collar ranger and didn't have a college degree, but I assumed that wasn't really the choice anyway. I assumed we could figure out how to have toilet paper and birds and trees. We had put a man on the moon after all. Then I went to graduate school and learned that we had not put a man on the moon. Rocket scientists did that. And from what I'd been able to ferret out about them, they were engaged in projects for which they were more highly remunerated than toilet paper designers. Projects like designing rockets. So it fell to all of us using the woods to think about what we wanted and what we were willing to tender. Non-loggers, backpackers mostly, favored listing the owl and protecting the wilderness it lived in. 
they felt that loggers were encroaching on the wilderness. Owls thought the same thing about backpackers. Spotteds are as wise as any owl, but most people don't think so because they're hornless and cartoonists don't have anything around which to loop their tiny eyeglasses. Like all members of the charismatic owl genus known as Strix, spotted owls are dish-faced and round-eyed. Three species of Strix shared the wilderness area I patrolled, barred, great gray, and spotted. You would be thrilled to emerge from a tent in the wilderness and look into the eyes of any dish-faced owl. In fact, you'd be thrilled just to realize you were in the wilderness. I know I was. The loggers with whom I shared the woods felt the same way. Although I was a backcountry ranger with the National Park Service and loggers worked for the private sector, our, habitats, our habits were similar. We both worked in the woods, avoided civilization, and dressed and groomed so oddly that from a distance our genders defied classification. We did not have college degrees. Our jobs required a little supervision and a lot of muscle. No one would mistakenly call us well paid, and still we would not trade our quality of life for more money. Which is to say, loggers weren't crazy people. If the amount of work and salary for cutting 10 trees matched that for cutting, cutting 10,000 trees, well, loggers would rather, it's obvious, isn't it? We all wanted a good, honest life in the woods. I wanted that life after leaving the park, but when I'd earned my doctorate, I felt that acceding to a brass badge, a starched uniform, and unhelpful policies was too much to pay for that privilege. I wanted to manage my own land, not someone else's. I wanted to sink into land and wrap it around myself, and I wanted the land to reside in a special place, somewhere with an equitable distribution of power between people and nature, a place where sometimes nature would refuse to let us boss her around. And that is the end of that um, section. And um, that is kind of showing you how I'm slowly moving to, as I said, adopt Fox currency, and I've kind of pulled myself out of the circle of civilized or domestic and realized that I'm more in this other circle uh, over here. Something, I guess the elephant in the, in the book or the room is, is anthropomorphism and that is the belief that there are certain traits, personality traits, that only animals should have non-human animals. And one of the most important things I realized from spending so much time with the fox was not that we should change our attitude about anthropomorphism, but we should, but that wasn't the most important thing. What I realized that most people are anthropomorphic, meaning that they fear the image of animals acting like people, but more so they fear the image of people acting like animals. And that has been something that I've really noticed more and more and isn't going away. It's not so much that we want to put people here and animals here because we, we just don't want to think that animals might be more similar to us. It's that we really don't want to think that we might be more similar to them. And yet we have something called human nature and what is human nature is actually animal nature because we're animals and our nature goes back a very, very long way. And then we have some things that are meant to be helpful, but as long as we realize they're separate from nature, things like culture, politics, religion, all those things that are human constructs, those aren't part of human nature. So we do have a basic nature and I think it's very different from sometimes from the things that get in the way of our nature. It has helped me when I've tried to solve some problems to go back and think, wonder what my human, what my actual nature, if I kind of get rid of all the stuff that's in my way that's complicating my life, I wonder uh, what, which direction I would be going in. I wanted to, um, 
I wanted to read you a section specifically about from the point of view of another animal because, um, as I said, I've realized not so much that animals are more like us, but I've, I'm beginning to see how I'm more like other animals, and I'm starting to see not them in my eyes, but actually, as you read the book, you'll realize that what I'm seeing is I'm seeing myself in their eyes, and I think that gets back to the question of their voice. And so here's a section where I'm really seeing myself in their eyes, and I do have, I have ants and magpies and an eagle and even um, fox, and here's a section of the book um, talking about myself in uh, the eyes of some other little creatures. Abandoning their wet, writhing newborns in the nursing chamber, they marched past the voles and into the tunnel. Silent, solemn, and quick, the adults pushed through the thick vegetation at the entrance and joined with thousands of fellow emigrants fleeing parallel tunnels. Keeping their heads down, they merged into a single line and marched into the sun, condemning all the summer's newborns to a slow and lonely death of starvation was not a decision easily made. The queens, however, did not have the sovereignty to think exclusively about their own colony. A greater command forced the abandonment. A species cannot survive if its leaders do not know when to say, die. The queen selected a three-tooth sagebrush that was splitting at the base, and their minions swarmed, biting into its soft bowl and spraying it with formic acid until the vessels collapsed and the shrub withered. The stem hole became the ant's new main chamber. Thatch ant mounds the size of red-tailed hawk nests blistered the territory. They were indistinguishable from every other pile of detritus. Who would notice if an ant nest moved from one side of a blue-roofed house to the other. The aphids noticed. They clung to the soft, velvety branches of white sage, sucking its sap and excreting honeydew. Orange-headed thatch ants were addicted to that honeydew. With their sharp, deep mouths and formidable arsenal of venom, they fought off any creature threatening the aphids. In this way, aphids and ants, like magpies and flickers, had twined their lives together into one thicker, stronger cord. The white sage noticed, when the ants left, red polka dot ladybugs swarmed the white sage, devouring the aphids. Bigger, hungrier insects followed the ladybugs. By the next new moon, most of the sage had been squeezed through the grasshopper offal and returned to dust. The round-bellied magpie noticed, Mindful of her neighbors, the matriarch waited until the ant's evening dormancy before wallowing in the thatch mound and dusting off her mites. It mattered very much to one of her fledgings, who waited until after the ant immigration before dropping feet first into the abandoned ant nest. A cloud of fungal spores enveloped the fledging, blotting his black hood feathers until they turned gray. He was still gasping, when a bony-legged Cooper's hawk grabbed him. The ants had feared only one enemy, shade. As they had for thousands of years, for part of each day, for eight months each year, the 30,000 ants needed sunlight. In that sagebrush steppe country of short grass and cactus, it had not seemed like much to ask. But a blue-roofed house the first permanent human-built structure in that township and range since the most recent ice age had abated, had sprung up in an instant. It sheltered a person who tended weeds that blocked the sun and brought forth a monster shade that devoured the ants. Weeds and people were impractical enemies. Weeds were too numerous and dynamic to battle, and houses, even cottages, were too large to attack. Thatch ants 
had not survived thousands of years by casting blame. They survived by recognizing their immediate enemy and choosing correctly whether to fight or flee. Because they could not fight the shadow, they fled. In that, stagebrush, in that sagebrush, step country, of short grass, cactus and cottage, eight hours of sunlight was in fact too much to ask. And that, I know you probably hate that chance as much as I do, and I really do hate that chance. And I put diatomaceous earth on their little hills whenever I can. But here I'm writing about, and you know, fat chants are just everywhere in this country, and fat chants are very aggressive. But here I'm not writing about the ants from my point of view and how I can't stand the fact that they bite me and I have to, and I'm limp for so long and I have to keep ice on the bites and the worst bites in the world. I'm writing about how I have affected them because I let these weeds grow up when I tore up the land to build my house and that caused a shade and the weeds weren't very big but they shaded out the thatch ant. And so I, from just watching what happened to that nest and watching what the birds did and watching the magpie get, um, choked up by the fungal spores and eaten by a cooper's hawk, I was starting to realize how I look in their eyes. And before you, you have a question, I want to let you know something about my best friend, the fox. But I'm going to see if you have any questions first. Do you all know what the fat chance are? I hope you never meet any. Oh. They're called thatch because they take the little tiny pieces of detritus, little tiny twigs, and they build huge, huge nests. And their bites are really bad. Maybe you don't have them in Billings, but I would think sagebrush, they like that sagebrush country, steppe country, dry country. Well, good for you if you don't have them. <laughs> don't get too close. They're, they're really aggressive. Uh, so this is fox. Having slept, and you'll, you'll see a different voice, I think, about when I uh, write about Fox, and of course he's sort of the star of the book. Having slept since mid-morning in the shade of his favorite boulder, the fox woke to the heat of a sinking sun. Pointing his butt skyward and his nose windward, he stretched his neck along a foreleg that was naked as a newborn mouse. The fur wasn't actually gone, just misdirected. Turning tailward, he discovered his fur blowing flat back, leaving the hide on the front of his legs, exposed but warm. A mouse was scraping through the gravelly soil with footsteps as heavy and hesitant as a pregnant female's. The mouse was almost close enough when a wind whip cracked the dried grasses and wiped out the soundtrack. Weasel pee! And his day was just starting. Below, on alfalfa flat, the wind was not blowing. A tangle of mice tumbled under a shadow of shrubs, and partridge bustled in the hedgerows. But not for him. The flat belonged to his mother, and she permitted access to only her mate and their freshly weaned kits. Her permission, however, rarely got in the way of the fox's plans. He was a yearling now, with agility enough to test her vigilance. In fact, trespassing forays frequently topped the fox's agenda. For now, he planned to avoid his mother's territory and visit the house with the shiny blue roof. The house perched on the hillside below his den and above his mother's. Its roof appeared to sit directly on the ground with sagebrush and juniper spilling over its north and south flanks. In fact, it was situated much like his own den. Both homes burrowed into the same mountainside and exposed themselves fully to the rising and setting sun. Both faced the curvy, glinting river and hid from the cold north wind. Well, my house is on the Yellowstone River, just like most of yours is too, only on two hours up, up river from you folks. He scanned the hillside checking possible routes that led to the house. The dry channel was noisy, but he wasn't on a covert mission, and it presented fewer challenges overall. Picking up the channel trail required traversing a windy ridge. Ahead of the wind, a gigantic cloud was colliding with Round Hill. 
Crouching between a couple of chin-high cactus blades, he nearly stopped breathing to keep their spines from poking his chest. Fair price to pay for watching a cloud performance. After crashing into the hill, the cloud burst open and flew into pieces. On plan, thick clumps of perennial grasses rattled in the dry channel, their stalks bending under the weight of ripe seed heads. Long and thin as fish bones, grass seeds matted his fur and pierced his hide. Stopping at a small rose bush, he combed himself against the thorns. Now lighter, he skipped down the draw, tilting side to side as if he were a vole thieving hawk on low glide. Cactuses, wind whips, fishbone seeds, these were not optimal digs. The alfalfa flat foxes were probably half asleep on their green field, mouths open, waiting for some errant mice to run blindly across the short, soft grasses and impale themselves on undeserving canines. Those were optimal digs. Well, they would be if you were one of those foxes whose only purpose in life was commanding a hunting ground with a high density of dim-witted mice. And you can see I understand a lot about the fox and how his personality seemed to be so different. And there I'm comparing him to the foxes that lived on alfalfa flats that seemed to have a much easier life than he did. He was not in a, a very nice uh, habitat, but he was a good hunter. And the habitat he chose had me in it. So um, I think he, he thought it was a good idea to make a friend, which is something that I didn't really know uh, at the time. Um, but I learned from him. And before I go on, I have, I'm going to see if you have any questions too, but I have a question for you guys. Have you watched um, animals in your life and thought maybe they're more than just something that just cares about eating and reproducing, but you just thought no because people will just think you're crazy or something or modern society just frowned on that but i you know your your grandmother's time people probably didn't frown on it at all but they do now but i'm just asking does anybody want to put their hand up and tell me about an animal yes go ahead <laughs> where i live and my daughter lived upstairs for a while we have some very unruly squirrels and they have <laughs> quite an attitude get up in the tree where they can see in my kitchen window and say, hey, lady, yeah, piece of food. <laughs> and I thought it was amusing, but it was startling because I could feel something looking at me when there wasn't anything possible, and there he was. He's done it so many times, <laughs> countless. But he would get in the second floor window and bang on her glass and scare her, and he'd make her so mad. <laughs> like, I'm sorry, I'll go feed them. <laughs> you <laughs> see, your buddy out of my window. <laughs> you see, I'm, but I'm... That I'm just so thrilled that you're, it adds so much to your life, and it's it came from inside you, which means it's your human nature. I call it human nature, but I also sometimes call it common. It comes from your common sense. I mean, it, it's it's just the way humans have been forever, and then we tried to shut that door by saying, you know, you can't deal with animals unless you have a unless you're a squirrelologist and you have a PhD in squirrelology, but you don't, but you still understand how to communicate with a squirrel, which makes you squirrely. Note. <laughs> <laughs> you have an animal, too. Uh, well, my kids, I thought I was a little bit nuts because uh, we have dogs, cats, even reptiles, blue dragon, ball python, and we see an expression or something, and I would be talking like animal is talking to them. <laughs> but it was, they had expressions. Yes. And it's like I could sort of read those expressions, and, this, and I had a cat, and then I was like, she's almost like a cat, she's like a dog cat. But she talks to me, I talk to her. It's like, I'm in a group of companions, and people think I'm a little bit nuts with it. I don't I care. Don't. I don't, I think you. <laughs> understand what's happening. So you said they have expressions, and one of the things that's really interesting, let's think about foxes, wolves, and coyotes. 
To us humans, all coyotes look alike. I realize they don't all look alike to them, but coyotes all look alike. They have just one kind of coat color pattern. The only thing that's the same about red foxes, all red foxes have a white tip on their tail, but red foxes can be black or red or blonde or black and red. They come in all different colors and they have markings on their face that make it look like they have expressions, something that humans can recognize. The same with wolves, or Canis lupus is a wolf, which is the identical species as a chihuahua. A chihuahua is Canis lupus also, they're just different subspecies. So animals that you, like cats, that all look different, it's quite possible, quite likely, that the reason why some animals look different to us is because they have traveled along with us, they've evolved with us, they've changed with us, they, to, to benefit from being having different expressions that humans can recognize. Because animals can always recognize themselves. I mean, coyotes certainly can tell one coyote from another, a deer can tell one from another, but it seems like there is a reason why foxes have obvious markings on their face and why they're different, why they look different and why we can tell them apart. And cats do as well, of course, all all look different, and, and wolves look different. Wolves, which are essentially dogs, look different. So you're not really crazy if you think that an animal has an expression, because some animals look different to people, and some animals don't look different to us. And I think it's because we've been, and I made some conjectures in the book, although in the book I'm clearly letting you know that there are conjectures um, about uh, how I think foxes and humans have traveled along together as buddies for a long time. And, and we're not really buddies with foxes anymore. Well, for one thing, cats have been introduced into this part of the world, but long before cats, I think, um, I mean, foxes have, have a value for their fur, unfortunately, and I think that might have thrown a monkey wrench in the situation because people had a choice of we can be friends with you or we can kill you and sell your little pelt. And so if you start killing them and selling their little pelts, then foxes are gonna start staying away from you and you're not gonna be able to have that experience. And so it's hard to know, but I think that has interfered, the fact that so many people had decided for so long to just kill foxes because their, because their fur was worth something and they started trying to stay away from us. But it is true that we think that a lot of animals, for example, are nocturnal. And that's only because they're nocturnal when we're, we're around, but they prefer to be out sometimes in, in the daylight. I have skunks on my property that are often out in the daylight, but I'm the only one around and I don't bother them. And Fox, of course, we would never have developed a friendship if he was only out at night, because I'm not out, at, I'm not a night owl at all. I like to avail myself of the full moon, but the opportunities to avail yourself of a full moon in Montana are really few and far between. Is 10 months of the year, it's too cold to go outside. <laughs> in the night, no, well, at least nine months out of the year. Anyway, you, you can't really see in a full moon unless it happens to be a clear night, so there's that, and there just aren't that many full moons coming around. But if there's a full moon, I, sure, I, I love the light of a full moon, but otherwise, I'm not a night owl, and neither was Fox a night owl, so we kept the same kind of schedule. And I think that if there are animals that are absolutely nocturnal, probably it is going to be really difficult for you to develop a relationship with them. But your cats and dogs, they have pretty much the same schedule that you do. Any, any other questions? Well, one of the most important things that I learned watching Fox when I started to realize that he seemed to have a better life than I did. And when I met him, I was trying to get out of the backwoods, away from the mountain. I mean, I had a PhD and I thought I should use it and there's no way to use it there. So I thought I would have to go move to a city. And then he showed up and started dogging me around and I was really torn. It was a terrible question. I was at that point in my life where I had to figure out what to do, and I was trying to figure out if I wanted to be a professor or a lab scientist, be a scientist with the government. Everything I kept thinking about was 
a title, a career track, basically a noun. And then I started watching Fox, who was happy all the time. And I started thinking, you know, you studied animals. We don't categorize, we don't give foxes titles like that. They don't have jobs. They're just foxes. And their opinion of themselves and how they categorize themselves probably has to do with what they do. He distinguished himself from other foxes because he was just such an amazing hunter. But there's lots of different things that animals do. And I realized that that was just a much better way to live. Instead of trying to ask myself, what do I want to be now that I'm grown up? I'm going to ask myself, what do I want to do now that I'm a grown up? And I'm going to stop defining myself as a noun. And I decided that what I want to be is a verb. That's what everybody should really be, a verb. And then I thought, I like writing. And I like tending land. I like taking care of property. I like observing wildlife. I like talking to students. But it, they don't have to be students at a university. I don't have to be a professor to do that. I don't need any particular career to do certain things. Once you figure out the things that you want to do, writing, teaching, observing wildlife, tending land, that's your problem is solved. And just and as I tell students today, who knows how you're going to end up using those things? Who knows what title you're going to have or what career? But pick. Be a verb first, pick the things you want to do, and then what I learned, which I should have known because I used to collect plants, and at Voyagers National Park when I was collecting plants and putting them in the herbarium, every single plant, just like every animal, is categorized in two ways. One is its habit, and one is its habitat. And you all know what the habitat is, where it lives. But animals are also categorized by their habits. What do they do and where do they live? And I realized, rather than picking a career and going wherever, this is what I need to pick. What's my habit? And those are the verbs. And what's my habitat? And I realized my habitat is where I was living. I like living out in the wild, away from people. I like living where there's lots and lots of animals around me and where I can see the sun setting at the same time the moon is rising. I like a lot of open country. I don't like crowds or noise, or a lot of confusion going on around me. So I picked my habit and habitat, and I learned that from watching the fox. And that has really changed much of um, everything. I wonder if I have time to say one more. Uh, no, I'm going to just do one more thing. I won't read, but one paragraph. Um, the last most important thing that I need to tell you, and I'll see if you have any more questions. If you are going to be, and some of you already have been, friends, um, whether it's a cat or a squirrel or a deer, whatever, fox, I hope, whatever animals you choose, if you're going to be friends with wild animals, you need to realize that they just don't live very long. And you have to have a different understanding of longevity. And I know from research that I did about the COVID uh, pandemic and people looking for dog pets that everybody cares Almost firstly, how long does this breed live? People want long-lived dogs because people are afraid of getting too close to something that's going to die. And you have to kind of put that aside if you want to be friends with um, an animal. And so I, I know um, watching, looking at rainbows, and any time, there's so many rainbows where I live, and there probably are here too. Every time you see the rainbows, you stop, even though they might be just like a blink of an eye. And I love rainbows so much. But they're not long-lived. But that doesn't detract from their value. And I learned to accept the fact that foxes, like rainbows, have an inherent value that is quite apart from its longevity. And that's a really important thing to realize, that your value has nothing to do with your longevity. This is what I know from my common sense, from my human nature. I know this. Everybody that I've ever loved, everybody that I love now, is going to die too soon. It doesn't matter if your grandma's 120 when she dies. It's still too soon. Everyone you love dies too soon. <coughs> Everyone you hate has already lived too long. <laughs> That's 
what I have to leave you with, but I want to see what your questions are. Please. Sorry about that, but that's the truth. <laughs> yes, hon? Um, is your book available in like an aud audible uh, format? Yeah, it's so audible is the thing that just goes in your ear. Not the electric the book. car. You yes. know, I listen to books. Right, so there's two of those things. One is called Audible and the other is called Libro, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yep. There's two companies, um, Audible and Libro. And I think, because I don't do either of them, but I did listen to the gal who is the actor who recorded Fox, and I listened to uh, quite a few. And of course, they're outstanding because they're professionals, but I really like the gal that reads. Um, Fox and I. So there's two companies, and you can get those, I think, at any bookstore. Libro, or I think you get Libro at the bookstore or even at the library, and then uh, Audible is, everybody probably knows where to get Audible, but you can just Google up or ask anyone, and the librarians or any bookstore person can help you. Libro FM, it's Libro.FM, right? Uh huh, yes, Libro.FM and Audible.com, right? Yeah, Audible.com. It's also in ebook um, format and hardback and paperback. Yes. Thanks for asking that. I think one of the things I really admired about your book is um, the affection and yet kind of the distance you can keep. Like, you know, call me on the box, you and me. You know, because I, I put myself in there because I've had a relationship with domesticated animals, granted, but. You know, I have this temptation to name and feed, and you know, I don't know if I could keep that kind of respectful distance of the wild animal. And I guess you know, I'm just wondering how you. How you I had to keep that. That's a good question. I know that it's really tempting, and I had a, a lot of folks ask me, "How how do you resist reaching out and touching him?" But it's um it's about respect, and I really really wanted to have a friend and understand what it means to have a friend. And when you have an actual friend, you have to be on equal footing. You can't just reach out and grab your friend's hair or their clothing or just because they're like next to you. You just don't do that. You have to, res you just don't. So I wanted him to be as independent from me as any one of you are from me so that he had his own will to come and spend time with me when he wanted to. It was difficult, especially when you think that that they're hungry and you really, really want to feed them. Um, he probably wouldn't like anything I ate. As as you know, he taught me to stop eating kale because, because life is too short, <laughs> really. So I stopped. He put his nose up at that. So I realized, I, I learned a lot of things from, from him that, and that he was right about. And I think it's really, I think you should try the next time you have the opportunity to be close to a domestic animal, to try to put them on equal footing because I don't think you can develop empathy if you're in a position of power. And if you're feeding them or touching them, then you are in a position of power. And it's not the same, then it's like a pet. And I don't think, people always say they want, they want a dog because they want unconditional love, but that's not unconditional love. That animal is completely dependent on you, and so I didn't want to have that kind of a relationship with him. But still, you can do, when we had that really bad earthquake, it was over a seven, I did walk up to his den. It was around 11 o'clock at night, I think. It was dark anyway, and I had my flashlight, and I went up and just sat outside the den just so that he would know that the other big mammal in the area was still there and nearby. I figured it must have been scary as hell to be feeling from the, you know, a small animal from the ground that a shaking of the earth. So I did that, but I, again, I didn't feed him or touch him or try to teach him to fetch. I don't, <laughs> I don't think he would have done that. He had a little too much pride. <laughs> Question? that animals do have different personalities because I have squirrels and the, the first set of squirrels, I'm gonna say, in my backyard teased my dog. They'd sit at the top of the tree and make their little sound and tease the dog and just, and now the squirrels that are there, they run away. 
they're like, oh, there's a dog. We got to get going. So it's nice to know that it really is just it, the different, different squirrels. Yeah. Especially something that's really prolific like a squirrel or a fox. I mean, foxes are whole arctic. They, red foxes live everywhere. They're almost as prolific as humans are, but so are squirrels. Yeah. If you have a population that, and it's so tiny, then of course the gene, is, the gene pool is going to be constricted. It's called a bottle. There used to be a lot of animals, and suddenly there's only a few. Well, they, can, they might not have a lot of different personalities because they're all related because there's not very many of them. But when you think about things like cats, which are all over the planet, and squirrels and foxes, um, then definitely, yes, they have, they have different personalities, and I don't feel like it's anthropomorphic to... Um, I, I will say, when, if you pick up a copy of my book, you'll see this badge on there from Nautilus. It's a... It's an award for a book that made the biggest difference in uh, the world, and there's different categories. Animals is one category, and I won the Nautilus Gold last year for animals, mm -hmm. and the person that won the year before me was Carl Safina, and, and I was reading his book at the time that I found out I won, and one of the things that I read in Carl Safina's book was that uh, he says, and he's mostly talking about voice and audience, he's not writing to us, He's writing mostly to other scientists. But as he writes in his book, he really encourages us to forget about the walls of anthropomorphism, to forget about all that, and to start moving in the direction of accepting that animals have personalities. But make sure before you do that, he says, and I'm, he says, I'm not joking about this, make sure you have tenure first. <laughs> so, right. So just, so just keep that in mind. Don't say I didn't warn you. Well, I should let you escape, and then I'll go to the... Um, I'm so thrilled that you're here, and I'm really glad to be in Billings and that I didn't get very terribly lost getting here. I had, like, three pages of instructions, like three streets, and it's only three miles, but there's a lot of turns in those three miles. I'm not a big city person. This is my first time in Billings. Anybody know the biggest crime working on a novel? But it's the same kind of uh, ideas, people that live like this, um, and why we enjoy and have to live the way that we have to live. And the characters, just just animals and plants and everything in the natural world is so much a part of their life. But people do get murdered in there, and so it's <laughs> But there's not anything gory. It's really weird. Yeah. But, um, yeah. but people do die. So <laughs> I'm in love with the characters. And uh, they're living in this big purple two-tone purple Victorian mansion from the 1800s. It's a, and I've been loving doing research on uh, Victorian mansions, so I have all these pictures. It's in a very isolated gorgeous <laughs> <world. laughs> of course. Thank you for having, you know, as far as botany, this is what I really believe. If you care about plants, you never are going to get old because every day there's something to look forward to. Every day they're different. Every morning I get out and I, even when it's really cold, I get out and just see what's what and who's doing what. And they, they're all changed. They're just all different every day. Mostly they're different because somebody else's teeth marks <laughs> are on them. But also, there's different buds coming out, and there's different flower heads here and there, and, and uh, the voles are eating around this one. And, but they're different every day. They all just gives you always something to look forward to. I'm glad you took the book. I'm glad the book encouraged you, and especially yeah. grasses, because we have so many grasses in Montana. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who knew? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, you don't mow your lawn anymore. I don't mow, so that um, I get to see all the flowering heads. It's gorgeous. I, I, thank you so much. That was so wonderful.